like to thank the Beckman Foundation for this opportunity to describe the use of mass spectrometry in atmospheric chemistry research. My name is Paul Wenberg. I'm a professor at the California Institute of Technology. And for more than 20 years, we've been developing mass spectrometers for an array of applications in diagnosing the composition of, of Earth's atmosphere. Atmospheric chemistry research remains uh, a observationally limited science. New discoveries have, have come from the development of new analytical methods. Our first instrument that we built was for NASA's ER-2 aircraft. This is a high altitude airplane operating near 20 kilometers, single piloted and unpressurized in the wing pods where our instrument uh, was housed. It was a significant engineering challenge given the mass, um, uh, temperature and, and power limitations of the, of the aircraft. So since that time, we've continued to evolve our methods and our instruments, primarily to study the chemistry that controls the composition of the lower atmosphere, the so-called troposphere. And today I will describe some of the work we have done towards understanding atmospheric photochemistry and its role in mitigating air pollution chemistry. As a child, I visited my grandfather in Southern California. I was impressed, not in a good way, by the pall of air pollution that on its worst days obstructed visibility and made outdoor exercise unhealthy. Of course, when I visited, this was not a new thing. This was a very old problem, a classic old problem. And why was air quality so poor in Los Angeles? 1947, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors created the Air Pollution Control District to address a growing environmental crisis around air quality. They hired Arnold Beckman. Well, at the time sulfur chemistry was promoted as the culprit, Beckman had a hunch that they were going down the wrong path. He explained, I'm a chemical engineer from Illinois and we used to have to visit sulfuric acid plants in Whitting, Indiana. Such a potent and pungent odor that comes from sulfur. You can smell it long before it has any physiological effects on you. So the nose is really an underappreciated instrument for studying complex chemical mixtures. To learn more, Beckman and Caltech uh, hired a natural product chemist, Ari Hagensmith who would go on to become the first chairman of California's Air Resources Board. Hagenschmidt, together with Beckman, developed new instruments to study air chemistry, and they even patented one of them, shown here. Roger Turner, historian for the biography, The Industrial Chemist, explained, Beckman and Hagenschmidt suck about 500 liters of particularly smoggy air on a particularly smoggy day through their cold trap, and they're able to condense out just a few drops or two of this brown goo. Hagensmith made this little drop or two of goo and analyzed it and deduced that it's made up of peroxyl materials, which are sort of organic acids and partially burnt hydrocarbons. Air pollution is one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality globally. Despite the large progress in air pollution chemistry since Beckman's time, Los Angeles and many of the world's major cities remain a pall. So why have mitigation efforts fallen short? Well, since Beckman time, advances in mass spectrometry in particular have enabled a much more complete view of this organic goo that drives poor air quality. And these instruments are providing new insights in how mitigation efforts need to be adjusted. One of the key advances has been the development and commercialization of aerosol mass spectrometer, principally by coupling a time of flight field hardened mass filter built by the Swiss company Toffworks, integrated with an aerosol sampling and ionization stage by the Massachusetts based analytical company Aerodyne. These instruments have enabled large advances 
and provide bulk chemical analysis of the submicron sub uh, particulate that controls the visibility and is critical for understanding the health impacts of, of air pollution. In this chart, the major findings from these instruments is illustrated. In cities all around the world, more than half the mass of the particulate is made up of Beckman's organic goo. How does Beckman's organic goo form in the atmosphere? One of the key advances made in my laboratory over the past few years has the recognition that a process called auto-oxidation, whereby in a single step, um, numerous oxygen molecules can be added to the much more reduced precursors. The stepwise hydrogen shift chemistry can lead to very rapid formation of highly oxygenated compounds, such as those shown on the right side up here, containing hydroperoxy groups. And our research group has developed methods that allow us to observe this chemistry in situ without any preconcentration, um, and thereby to quantify the rates and the processes involved in the formation of these compounds. The enabling technology is negative ion chemical ionization mass spectrometry. These are clustering methods where we create an anion. In our laboratory, we've primarily focused on CF3O minus, which efficiently clusters with multifunctional oxygen containing organic chemicals. It forms the parent ion plus the mass of the anion, and we run those through a time of flight mass spectrometer and are able then to quantify the presence of numerous, um, numerous oxygenated compounds. Most recently, we've developed a rather special gas chromatography pre-column, pre, uh, whereby we collect, uh, cryotrap these chemicals on the column directly no metals, as metals degrade these uh, hydroperoxides, and at low pressure are able to quantify extremely small concentrations of individual isomers of the precursors. In 2016, we took this new instrument to the top of this tower in northern Michigan to study the photochemistry of isoprene one of the chemicals that greatly alters atmospheric composition. Isoprene is produced by almost every deciduous tree in enormous abundance, highly reactive dialkene. Upon oxidation in low NOx environments, it produces hydroxyhydroperoxides. The subsequent oxidation of those compounds leads to the formation of epoxides, which have been now uh, shown to play a major role in forming small aerosol particles in rural environments. Shown here is a chromatogram of air where we collected onto the column a small amount of the, um, the ambient air at the top of this tower. Here, concentrations below 100 parts per trillion are easily quantified of all the major isobaric um, compounds produced from isoprene, both the hydroxyhydroperoxides in the first generation and then the subsequent formation of these epoxides. More recently, we have deployed our mass spectrometers on NASA's DC-8 aircraft to study wildfires and their role in uh, impacting urban pollution chemistry. Here, from northern Idaho, we sampled a number of western wildfires following the plume chemistry as it evolved after the um, emission to the atmosphere.
One of the key findings from our research and other laboratories studying air quality around the world is that each city has its own unique, diverse challenge with respect to air quality. In Mexico City, we showed that fire, open fires burning from both trash and from the nearby mountains was a major contributor to the air pollution challenges of the city. In London, pollution from diesel um, automobiles is a major contributor to their air pollution challenge. In Delhi, small engines, um, as well as the broader industrial activities seem to be the major challenge with respect to air quality. And finally, in Beijing, industrial um, emissions of solvents are play a major role in the in their air quality challenges. We learn these things by measuring what's in the air. And that's really the key for how to make progress. We need to first understand where is the fuel for the smog coming from before we can design adequate policies designed to mitigate these air quality challenges. At the time that Ari Hagenschmidt and Arnold Beckman were studying the air quality challenges of, of Los Angeles, it became clear that both the high levels of ozone and of particulate were fueled by losses of gasoline from automobiles. The invention of the three-way catalytic converter has greatly cleaned up the automobile fleet. During the pandemic last year, observations we made from the top of our laboratory at Caltech showed that currently now, automobiles play a minor role in fueling our continuing air quality problems. So where do the chemicals that lead to bad air quality in, in Los Angeles come from? Small engines play a large role, as do solvent emissions. And indeed, even emissions from all the chemicals that we use in our home now are seen to play a significant role in reducing visibility and impacting public health in the basin. But progress is, is clearly being made with the elimination of the major emissions from cars, we can see our way now to a clean Los Angeles, one where on almost every day, the visibility is good and the air quality is fine. It just requires us to continue to have vigilance, to continue to make measurements to identify what's fueling our air quality and how to uh, mitigate those emissions. The key enabling technologies that have allowed us to make such great progress has been coupling novel ionization schemes to time of flight mass spectrometry. And there are numbers of ways in which we can advance this, uh, this effort. We have uh, numerous possible ionization molecules, so we can use many different negative ion uh, chemicals, such as NO3 minus, I minus, CF3 O minus. And if we use them together, we learn a lot about what the volatility and what the chemistry that's driving air pollution is. New ideas around ion mobility in front of mass uh, in front of time of flight could um, greatly advance. But I think perhaps most profoundly would be continuing efforts to reduce the mass uh, and make these um, instruments much more compact. I can see a, a, a way towards producing a single instrument that one could deploy to a city anywhere in the world rapidly and within a few weeks effectively understand why the city's air quality problems are what they are. 
this is just a, a revolution in, in what used to be a problem that, for example, in Los Angeles has taken decades to figure out what's fueling our, our, uh, our air pollution. We can now do in just a quick um, single instrument uh, effort with multiple ionization schemes to, to figure it out. And what a wonderful thing to be able to do, to go into cities in Africa, uh, in Asia, and enable the public health infrastructure to essentially leapfrog and learn from what we have accomplished in, in for example, Los Angeles. The, the second thing that I've really learned over the time that I've been working at Caltech is just how interested our students are in building stuff. Um, you know, many of my students have gone on to work in industry, to work in academia, but one of the things that they have taken with them is this ability to build instruments. It's becoming uh, more and more rare um, as we move more towards the information age and students are primarily working on uh, data science. But those are the skills that I see as being an essential ingredient in continuing our science progress. And so I would hope that we can find our way towards maintaining this idea that there are instrument labs at universities that were able to, to train the next generation of instrumentation scientists, those who can on um, on, on their own, figure out what needs to be measured and, and how to do it. It really is the, um, the, the history of, of Beckman um, that illustrates just how profound this is, because it is with, with these new methods that we, that we make progress. <laughs>